Good morning, Creekside. For those of you here, welcome. Welcome, welcome. For those of you who are outside, please come on in and join us. to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations.
Praise God that he delivered us in such a way we can sing for joy. Beneath that 
Did anybody want more cowbell? <laughs> Sorry. Um, we're so glad you're here. Um, let me just pray for us, because we need it. I need it. <laughs> Father, we acknowledge that you are um, so excellent, that you have saved us by your blood, that we can claim no other righteousness except through your loving sacrifice. Help us to remember that each time we seek to act on our own strength and flesh, and not your power and your spirit. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, it's great to see you guys. Uh, all I can say is sit down, fasten your pew belts, and enjoy. Three ways you can help our guests feel welcome on Easter Sunday. First, arrive a little early and sit near the center of the row so new people can easily grab an aisle seat. Second, look for new people and be friendly and say hello. Third, if you can, park on MacArthur, Dutton, or Dowling to free up spaces in the Creekside parking lots. One, please don't sit on the Say hello and smile Free. It would be really neat If you could park out on the street And four. repeat steps one through three Five. You'll make our guests so happy And if you feel you're welcoming is done Then 
just start back at one. Good morning, Creekside. We hope you'll join us for our Good Friday service at 7 o'clock p.m. on March 29th. Child care for infants. Good morning, Creekside. We hope you'll join us for our Good Friday service at 7 o'clock p.m. on March 29th. Child care for infants to five-year-olds will be available, but you must pre-register online. Visit creeksidecommunity.org slash Easter weekend to register your child. We will also have Easter Sunday services at 9 o'clock and 10.30 a.m. on March 31st. If this is your first time here, welcome. We're so glad you're here and would like to offer you a gift, the drinkware of your choice. You can pick this up at the information table in the lobby after the service. If you would like more information about Creekside or there's something we can be praying about for you, please fill out the gray card in the seat back in front of you. And if you are interested in serving at Creekside, please fill out the red card in the seat back in front of you. You can drop these cards in the offering slot. All infants through fifth graders may now go to their classes. Parents, if you have not registered your kids for Sunday school yet, you can do so now in the Children's Center lobby. Everyone else, say good morning to the people around you. Good morning. I, uh, I am a proud man, and uh, I was very proud that for over a year I haven't had a cold. And I had begun to think I am immune to colds. I will never get a cold again. Well, it hit me this week. And so I say that because if, if periodically during this, the next few minutes I have to take a coughing break, you'll understand, and you can just talk among yourselves if that's okay. <laughs> We have a uh, pastor's coffee this morning, right after this time, and if you'd like to meet some of the uh, staff and hear a little bit more about our church, it's in classroom number one, which is just down the hall here. You're welcome to come. There'll be some treats, but a uh, good time to get your questions answered. I hope you'll uh, join in. Let's pray, and we'll jump into Luke. Thank you, Father, for your word, and thank you for your spirit that enables us to understand your word, and we pray you'll be our teacher this morning. Pray you'll help us to understand how these truths apply to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In uh, Paradise Regained, his sequel to uh, Paradise Lost, John Milton made the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness the crucial event in Christ's work to restore this world to God. The world had been turned over to evil when Adam sinned, and when sin entered the world, death through sin and corruption, and the world became what it is today, a, a rebellious planet ruled by the ultimate rebel. 
And in the wisdom of God, he decreed that what had been lost by a human had to be regained by a human. And so Jesus became a man and the second Adam. And in the wilderness, this is kind of round two in, in the great battle against evil. Um, what started in the Garden of Eden, this is now a repeat, as Jesus now represents all people. The difference is, it's in the Garden of Eden, Satan's question to Adam and Eve is, can you be like God? Satan's question to Jesus is, can you really be a human? Or do you have to rely on your power as God to live as a human being? We're going to look at this passage this morning because it's a, a great passage on how Christ enables us to overcome temptation and, and even in a larger sense, how God deals with evil in the world. I want to look at three things this morning, three questions. Um, first of all, was Jesus' temptation real? Was this just kind of a play act since he's God and he can't sin? Or were these real temptations? Uh, second, how was Jesus tempted? And third, what does Jesus teach us about conquering temptation? First of all, was Jesus' temptation real? Last week we saw how Jesus began his public ministry after 30 years in obscurity. He, he travels from Galilee in the north down to the Jordan River where John is baptizing people in, in preparation for the kingdom of God and, and Jesus gets baptized. And as he's baptized, the heavens open and a voice speaks, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And the Spirit of God de descends on Jesus like a dove. And I think that's a pretty good opening for a ministry. Got everybody's attention. And I would think, okay, this is the time that Jesus now goes into ministry. But that's not what happens. And so let's read verse 1 of chapter 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. Jesus is directed by the Spirit of God who rests on him now to go out east from the Jordan into a wilderness area. Why? To be tempted. Did Jesus ever sin? Never did. Was he tempted? And that's important to see, isn't it? That there's a difference between temptation and sin. Because a lot of times when we're tempted, we think we've already sinned because we had a thought. Or we had a, 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 an urge. Uh, I'm angry, so I must have sinned. Or I'm lusting, I must have sinned. Or I'm afraid, I must have sinned. It's only sin if you assent to it. If you give in to it. Jesus is sinless, and yet he's tempted. See the distinction? A lot of people will say, yeah, but Jesus couldn't be tempted by sin. I mean, how can God be tempted to sin? Well, the thing to remember is that Jesus is not God cleverly disguised as a human being. He laid aside all of his privileges and powers as God and became a full human being, fully a man. Look what Hebrews says. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. And then in 4.15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. To become our Savior, to become, be able to represent all human beings, Jesus had to become a fully a human being and be tempted in everything we're tempted in and yet have victory over all those temptations. So that's what's happening in this, that Jesus really could sin, but he didn't. He chose to obey God as the perfect, perfect man. Luther used to say, uh, you can't keep birds from flying over your head but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. And, uh, and the idea there is you can't keep thoughts and temptations and stuff from invading, but you can certainly choose whether to give assent to them or not, say yes or no. Well, let's see how Jesus was tempted. In verse 13, it says, when the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. So I take that to mean that Jesus was tempted in the wilderness in all the ways we're tempted. 
It's interesting. Adam was tempted once, and he fell. Jesus was tempted in everything, all the temptations any human being has ever had, and he stood firm in all those things. But Luke focuses on three temptations because they're so typical of the things we, we uh, uh, are tempted in. Appetites, ambitions, and authority. So that's what we're going to look at today and how Jesus was tempted in these things. And what can we learn from Jesus about resisting these temptations? Let's start with the appetites. He ate nothing during those days, and when they had ended, he became hungry. The Spirit directs Jesus into the desert. There's no in and outs or 7-Elevens there, nothing to eat. So Jesus doesn't eat for 40 days, and I guess 40 days is about the limit of how long you can go without food without beginning to starve. And at the end of 40 days, Jesus becomes hungry. And it's not just, I'd like to have a burger hungry. It was, it was I've got to eat. I'm, I'm famished. And the devil said to him, if you're the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Now, that's not an unreasonable suggestion. Could Jesus have turned stones into bread? Yeah, he could. Are there commands in the Bible, don't turn stones into bread? No. So what's the devil up to here? He's tempting Jesus as a man to use his power as God to satisfy his immediate appetites. Because he knows that the minute that Jesus does that, he disqualifies himself from being our Savior. He's no longer been made like us. He has access to power we don't have. So really, this is a temptation we all, it's the te temptation of immediate gratification. Sacrificing the long-term good for short-term relief or pleasure. Anybody ever tempted in that? Now you say, but wait a minute. Jesus did miracles. Didn't he exercise the power of God all the time? Jesus did miracles as a man by depending on his Father. He said the, the Son can do nothing of himself. Whatever he does, the Father abiding in him does it. Remember the story of, of the woman with the issue of blood who is in a crowd around Jesus. And she says, if I can just touch his robe, I will become well. So she sneaks to the crowd and she touches his robe and immediately she's healed. And Jesus says, who touched me? And Peter, always ready to give an answer to every question, says, Master, you're surrounded by people. What do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching you. And Jesus said, no, someone touched me because I felt the power go out of me. God healed the woman through Jesus without Jesus even choosing to be involved. See, so when Jesus does miracles, he does miracles the way any human being would do them, by faith and dependence on God. And that's why Jesus says, he who believes in me, the works I do, he will do also in greater works than these because I go to the Father. And as you read through Acts, you see that the apostles and the early Christians did the same exact miracles that Jesus did, the same way Jesus did them, by depending on God. Does that make sense? So, back to this particular temptation, the, the temptation of appetite. We are always tempted to abandon God's purpose to satisfy our appetites now. Isn't that true? I know I should get up and get out of bed, but. I know I should stay on my diet, but. I know I probably should pay my bills now, but I know I shouldn't look at that, but I know we should wait till we're married, but we are all tempted to put our appetites ahead of God. Let's see what Jesus did. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy 8, 
where Moses is reviewing the 40 years in the wilderness with the Israelites. And he said, God let you go hungry from time to time so that you would learn that man does not live by bread alone but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Do you know that, that uh, faith needs to be exercised to grow? That faith just doesn't grow by itself. It's like, it's like your muscles. If you don't exercise, they won't grow. And so in the wilderness, God put his people in situations where they had to learn to trust him. He, he'd withhold food for a little while just so they'd learn to trust him to provide. They failed the test, by the way. Every time he did that, they began to weep and cry and murmur and how mean he was and they're going to go back to, Israel, back to Egypt and, and everything. They didn't trust him. Jesus responds the way they should have. God will feed me when he wants to feed me. My job is to trust him and trust his word. That's how he overcomes this temptation. He puts God and his word before his immediate pleasure, immediate relief, immediate appetites. Now we'll come back to that in a little bit, how, what we learned about temptation. Let's look at the temptation of ambition. And the devil led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And I, I imagine this to be that in just a moment, Satan showed Jesus every human kingdom from the beginning of time, beginning probably with the Tower of Babel, all the way through to kingdoms that have, haven't even been started yet. He shows him all those kingdoms. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory for it's been handed over to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. Now, at first glance, you think, now how could Jesus be tempted to worship Satan? I mean, that would be the last thing he would do. But think about it. Why did Jesus come to earth? To save us. To save us from evil and suffering and war and disease and injustice and, and all these things. And the devil is saying, you can have all that now. I run the world, I'll let you run it. You can be the king of kings and the lord of lords. You can have all the things you want. All I ask is just a small thing, just that you kneel and worship before me. It's easy. It's easy. Not, not, no harm, no foul. And you can relieve all the suffering and all the anguish and all the injustice and all the things that are going on in this world right now that I have so carefully engineered. You see the temptation? This is the temptation of compromise in order to satisfy your ambitions, no matter how good those ambitions might be. If you just weren't so hard-nosed, if you just weren't so honest, if you weren't so strict, you'd get much further in your profession than you're doing right now. You need to bend a little bit. You need to give a little to get a little, right? That's the temptation. Anybody ever experienced that temptation? We all have, haven't we? When we planted Creekside, we were, that was 1990, and so we were right on the leading edge of what was called the seeker-friendly movement. And Bill Hybels, Willow Creek, and, and uh, Rick Warren at uh, Saddleback were kind of the leading examples and proponents. And I went to all their, their, their uh, uh, seminars and read the books and stuff like that. It was, a, it, was, it was exciting because we were doing church in a new way. You know, we got rid of the coats and ties and robes and organs, and, and uh, we just, we made, we made church fun. We had lots of crazy skits and, and, and kind of Bible light, and uh, it was all designed to bring people in, and it worked. It worked. We had a lot of people coming at the beginning. And then other churches started doing that, too, and they started to grow, too. In fact, they grew bigger than we did, and, and uh, that wasn't fun, but not... <laughs> But not too long into that, I realized, you know, God hasn't called us just to get people to come to church. God has called us to make disciples of Jesus. 
And making disciples of Jesus is impossible without teaching the Bible. If you continue in my word, you're truly my disciple. And so I had to make a decision. Are we going to stick to the Bible even though we won't get as big a crowds coming in? We won't be quite as, as, as hip. Uh, we used that word back then. Uh, <laughs> But it was, I realized it was a compromise, and now 34 years later, I'm glad we stuck to our guns because God has blessed that. And there are a lot of great churches that started then but don't exist any longer because they compromised on the Word of God in order to bring more people in. And uh, eventually it caught up with them. Whatever your ambition is, your ambition is never more important than your integrity. No matter how, even saving the world. Let's see how Jesus answers this. Jesus answered him and said, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus says, My relationship with God is more important than success, or fulfilling my ambition, or becoming King of kings and Lord of lords, or saving the world from sin. My top loyalty is to God. And as the perfect man, he exhibits what loving God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind looks like in a practical way. He says, nothing comes before. I'm not going to worship you. My worship belongs to God. Let's look at the third area that he's tempted in. And that is the temptation of authority. He led him to Jerusalem had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so you will not strike your foot against the stone. The devil says, speaking of the Word of God, I can quote some scripture too. And here in Psalm 91, God promises to not allow you to fall or to hurt yourself. Do you believe that? Are you the son of God? Do you believe that really? Then jump. Jump. Now I'm thinking that's not much of a temptation. I mean, there's no way I'm going to jump off that tower. So why would this be tempting to Jesus? Well, look at how Jesus answers and it will give you an idea. Jesus answered and said to him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now he's quoting, from, again, from Deuteronomy, where God's people have run out of water, as they often do. And they come to God not in humility, not in prayer, but they demand, give us water. You know, you can bring us water again, do it again. If you don't give us the water, we're going back to Egypt. You're not measuring up as God. And that's what God calls tempting him. It's testing him. It's commanding God rather than obeying God. And so Jesus says, it's not my place to put God to the test. My place is to obey what God tells me to do. So I'm not, what would have happened if Jesus had jumped off? Only one of two things. He would have died. Or, I think more likely, he would have just kind of floated down in front of everybody at the temple. And in light of this incredible miracle of seeing a man jump off the top of the temple and not be harmed, people would have said, the Messiah, the Messiah, and he would have been acclaimed the Messiah, except everybody would still be in their sin. You see, that's the problem. This is the test of authority. You can believe that God can meet your appetites better than you can and trust him. You, you can believe that God will help you to get to your ambitions by trusting him rather than putting yourself before him. Even so, it's still possible to think you can give God orders, to tell God what to do. You're in control. Um, I've heard couples say, if God doesn't want us to get married, he's going to need to stop us. And he didn't. And they wished he did. I've heard people say, God is my healer. God can heal me. I don't need insulin. I don't need medicine. I'm going to trust God. 
and they died. Uh, I see people who don't want to live without it, want to live without a budget. God provides. I don't need to budget my money. God will provide. And eventually they kind of go bankrupt. Uh, the point is here, I've seen it in ministry a lot. One of the temptations in ministry is to make plans and then tell God about your plans. And then your plans don't work out and you go broke because you wasted all this money on this foolish thing, and you blame God. Why didn't you help us? That's commanding God. That's command. The, the point of the, you shall not tempt the Lord your God is that my job is to obey. God's job is to command. And so God's plan is much slower than Satan's plan. It's going to take Jesus. Jesus is going to have to go through rejection. He's going to have to go through suffering and persecution ultimately crucifixion, death, raising from the dead in order for God to complete his plan. It's a much slower, more painful process, but it's the best process. And Jesus is willing to wait for him on that. So what do we learn about how Jesus uh, overcame temptation? Well, three things. One, remember God. Remember God. Jesus remembers God at each of his temptations. He loves God more than he loves his appetites, doesn't he? He's loyal to God, and being loyal to God is more important to him than meeting his ambitions, no matter how noble those ambitions might be. He puts trusting God above commanding God. In every temptation, Jesus puts God first. He sees every temptation as a loyalty test of my commitment to God. And I put God before everything, and that's how I determine what I do. Proverbs says, the fear of the Lord, by the fear of the Lord, one keeps away from evil. Want to keep from evil? Keep away from evil? Remember God. How I respond to temptation reveals where my heart really is. A man who loves his wife doesn't commit adultery. A disciple who loves Jesus obeys Jesus. When we're tempted, God is usually the last person we think about, isn't it? As uh, James says, each one is tempted when he's enticed and carried away by his own lust. And when lust is conceived and give birth, it gives birth to sin, and sin brings forth death. That's our problem. When we're tempted, we're not thinking about God. We're thinking about what we want. So the thing that we learn from Jesus is remember God. What does God promise? What is God doing in your life? What has he done this far? Has he failed you yet? Trust him now. Remember God. Second, value patience. I love this. Jesus was able to defeat these temptations because he was patient. Each of the temptations is a temptation to immediate gratification. Make, make stones into bread. You can eat now. You don't need to be hungry. Um, take a shortcut. Worship me. You can have everything you want. You don't have to go through the cross. You don't have to go through rejection. You can be king, king lord of lord right now. Um, tell God what to do. Make him, make him work. God would ensure that he wouldn't starve. But his job was to trust God. That's the point. Because Jesus trusted God, he was able to wait. And, and the older I get, the more I see how patience is one of the primary virtues in the Christian life. We used to say, uh, when, we'd, when we'd ask somebody, what, what's God teaching you? When they say, well, I'm learning patience, they say, ah, you're not learning anything then, because people always say that. That's not true. That's not true. Patience is one of the primary virtues. Without patience, you cannot become mature. James says, let patience have its perfect result that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. Patience is the bridge to maturity. So God is always working on patience in us. That's the point. So because Jesus is patient, he can wait on God. He can take God's slow road. He can take the suffering road, the road of humility, because he believes that God is going to keep his promises reading a good book right now called uh, The Slow Ferment 
of the early church. And it's a study of, the, of about 200 A.D. to 500 A.D. And how this small, despised faith became the major faith of the whole Roman Empire. And the primary virtue in the early church was patience. They said God is patient, so we can be patient. We can love our enemies because God's going to take care of them. We can, we can love the ones aren't, our loved ones who aren't Christians yet because God is at work and we, can't, we don't have to pressure him. We can be patient in suffering, patient in, in giving, patient in all these things. And it was because of that patience they showed the difference that Christ made in their lives and more and more people believed until it was like, it was like a slow ferment of wine. Couldn't see it happening until it happened. And that's the way the early church grew. I find that impatience sets me up for temptation. You ever find that? Proverbs 9.2. It's not good for, be, for a man to be without knowledge, and he who makes haste with his feet sins. I get into problems when I'm in a hurry because I don't stop to ask God what to do. I don't need to. I know what to do. And then I don't. And I find whenever I'm in a hurry, whenever I want to get somewhere quick, I, that's when I have all the problems on the freeway. Uh, you know, whenever I want to get a problem solved quick, uh, that's when I cause more problems. I'm learning God wants me to be patient and rest in Him and wait on Him and just do the next thing. What is the next thing that needs to be done? Choose to be patient. Wait on God instead of acting and then regretting it later. Third, Jesus defeated temptation because he memorized the scriptures. Remember, he is, he is dependent on tools that every human being has access to. So how does he answer temptation? Quote scripture. It is written. It is written. It is written. There is power in the word. In fact, I have found that the areas that God has changed my life have been areas where I have memorized Scripture about that area and meditated on it until it became almost an automatic res uh, uh, response when I was tempted in that area. Nope, don't let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. Poor is he who works the negligent hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And if I have those scriptures in my mind and use them, that's when I find the power to overcome temptation. So, remember God when you're tempted. You'll all be tempted today, right? Be patient. Use scripture. Now, if God doesn't want us to sin, why does he allow us to be tempted? That's a good question. I want you to notice the results of Jesus successfully resisting all these temptations. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout all the surrounding district. See the, the process here? Verse 1 says the Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted. And at the end of the temptation, it says the Spirit in his power, led him into ministry. We don't experience the Spirit's power in ministry until we learn to experience the power of the Spirit in temptation. Spirit must be victor over me before he can be victor through me. And so that means temptations are not an unnecessary, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, not an unwelcome intruder. But temptations are absolutely necessary to get us where God wants us to be, to learn to depend on him, to submit myself to him, to trust him. As I learn to do that in my own daily life, then God is able to work through me in other people's lives by his spirit. Does that make sense? Temptation of Christ, finally, is the answer. Why does God allow evil to continue in the world? My friend Walter Martin was on a uh, late night talk show in New York City and uh, he was debating an uh, atheist. And the atheist said, now Dr. Martin, you believe in an all-powerful God, right? And Dr. Martin says yes. 
and you believe that God is also all good, right? Yes, I do. Well, if God was all powerful, he could eliminate all evil. And if God were all good, he certainly would eliminate all evil. And yet evil continues. Therefore, how can you believe there's a God? Well, Dr. Martin said to him, it's five minutes to 12. At midnight, you become God. And you get to tell us how you will eliminate all evil. And the atheist said, you're up to something, Walter. <laughs> he said, we're conferring omnipotence on you, not omniscience. So they had a commercial break. He came back on, and Dr. Martin said, okay, my friend the atheist is going to tell us how, if he were God, he will eliminate all evil from the world. And he couldn't say anything. Because he suddenly realized to eliminate all evil, he would have to eliminate all people. Or render people without a free will as robots. And those are things that God is unwilling to do. But what if God could deliver the world from evil and still keep our free will, our individuality intact? And that's what we believe he did through Jesus. That this great battle in the wilderness laid the foundation for how Jesus delivers us from Satan's power. Jesus comes to destroy the works of the devil. And he does that by living the life we couldn't live. Dying the death we deserve to die so that when we put our faith in him, our sins are forgiven, we're credited with Christ's righteousness, and Christ comes to live in our lives. And as he lives in our lives, we reenact this putting to death temptation over a lifetime which is preparing us for the new heavens and the new earth where there'll be no sin. But rather than a bunch of snotty-nosed kids up, apt to make the same mistakes again that we made here, we'll have been trained by the Spirit of Christ in us in how to put to death the deeds of the body. Does that make sense? So that God attacks the problem of evil at the, most, the smallest level, each person's individual life. And if you're a Christian today and you're not concerned about resisting temptation, saying no to sin, saying yes to good and to God's will, then I think you have to question, do I really know Christ? Is Christ really in my life? And if you're not sure, simply ask him. Say, Jesus, I need you. Come into my life. Make me the person you want me to be, and he will. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your example for bearing every temptation that we bear and yet without sin, that you might free us from sin and from death. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and sing. Thy faith in Christ, I'll walk with God. Journeys end in view, supported by his staff and rod. My Lord is safe and pleasant to sing that again. By faith in Christ, I walk with God. With him, my journeys end in view, supported by his staff and Traveled through a desert wide Where many around me blindly stray But he might say to be my guide And will not let me miss my way By faith in Christ I walk with God With him I journey Oh
temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man and God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so you may be able to endure it. Amen. Have a great day.